So I don't know. No um, sound. What? No sound. Yeah, hopefully this fixes it. Okay, so hopefully this fixes it finally. Um, yeah, I hate this. But it's always really hard to completely reset up OBS on a different computer because you lose internet. So uh, at this stage, I should be, I should, my sound should be now. So I uh, should be going now. Yeah, so that's it. Um, <laughs> okay, so I guess that we'll just start from the beginning. Um, so again, laid back Sunday stream. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Constant boomer jokes. So I'll read the super chats that were given on the last stream. Uh, thanks for your patience, but apparently I just lost wireless internet across one area of my house and it wasn't coming back. Uh, and if I don't do it in the central room, then it just doesn't work at all. Uh, I have no idea. Internet's been spotchy. I guess this is because the entire country is falling apart. But um, anyway, um, yeah, I, that's at least that's better. Hopefully now we're not getting the on and again, off again buffering problem that we were having last time when I was broadcasting. But again, um, so this stream was originally going to be on... I'll just start over from where I started last time. This stream was originally going to be on Vouch and the decline of dialectic in modern society. Um, I've been trying to do more streams with my face just because my face is already out there. And even though this is kind of crappy white light, I think it's better than I think it's better than having uh, nothing. You know, it's good to it's good to actually have. Uh, thank you. It's good to actually have I think a face associated with most of these things. Uh, originally, I was going to do the stream on just general discussions concerning internet blood sports, the whole Vouch phenomenon. I released a video last week on Vouch and the whole phenomenon associated with him. Uh, but then this week, it seems that anyone, any anything anyone wants to talk about just concerns these riots in Minneapolis, largely concerning the death of George Floyd. Now, I think, you know, the, the obvious way to handle this is to take a position of neutrality. And for a large degree, that's what I'd like to take. It, just looking at the video of the death of George Floyd, it was obviously a wrongful death. Some form of homicide seems to be probably the right charge to, to apply to the police officers that mishandled that situation and literally probably murdered him. The difficulty, and I said this in the original stream, and I'm going to summarize here, is that it takes time to put together a case of murder against police officers in particular. And there have been cases of people wrongfully shot by police and it's taken like four months to put this together. And the existence of a political, of any political pressure or particularly political pressure in the forms of riots or nationwide outrage actually pressures the DAs into applying charges that they can't possibly get to stick. And this is how a lot of guilty police officers walk, is that the DA feels pressure to get an indictment out. They go for two hard charges, and then it finally comes in that it wasn't that bad. And when they can't get the churches to stick, then the guy goes, oh my God, are we buffering again? Hopefully not. The, the, guy, goes, the guy goes free. If this is actually buffering again, then people can tell me. And I'm not so sure what we're going to do, because there's apparently no way to fix internet problems. Um, perhaps, uh, okay. Um, hopefully people are not, uh, I, <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, I appreciate people telling me when the audio is and video is bad, but make sure that's not on your end. So I don't interrupt the stream again. Um, I understand that basically no one was able to see it the first time I did this. So I'll delete the first stream and then just read the super chats when they become available on the new system. I had to reinstall OBS on my laptop, which is why there was a delay, but in the meantime, um, yeah, I mean, this is this is sort of the situation we're in. We have a corrupt police force, or at least one corrupt cop, it looks like, and uh, a mismanaged police force coming from a progressive city in a democratic government. That's the reality, and and so I guess the question is, what what do you want the larger collectivity of America to do about this? Uh, the obvious specific anger is on the death of this one man that was not obviously was wrongful and again, probably murder. 
But that's not what people are actually protesting. They're protesting, quote-unquote, institutional racism or general statistics about blacks getting shot by police, for which a case of institutional bias or problem is much, much harder to build because of statistics that we are categorically not able to talk about in the public square in America. Meanwhile, the Democratic progressive mayor of Minneapolis essentially for two nights turned the entire or a large swath of the city over to protesters, after which they burned a number of buildings, including a police precinct. So I guess I'm not so sure how much my sympathies are supposed to go towards a government that can't maintain order. This is one of the things about governments is that once they can't maintain order, in my mind, they lose a lot of their legitimacy. And so, so initially, I think the, the call, the way to handle this problem was to essentially just say, look, order is the prime purpose of government, but it's apparent that this system that we live under, the cathedral, the mainstream way we have of handling problems through this democratic process, and specifically the mainstream progressive way of handling political problems, as is evidenced by Minneapolis itself, this is not working for me. And so I... Other than sympathizing with the police officers who put their lives on the line and sympathizing with the family of George Floyd, there's really nothing more to say. It is a tragedy all around. It's a tragedy all around when we look at these things. So so that was my initial position. I guess what would eventually led to this live stream and what I thought was interesting to talk about, and I know I'm repeating myself from the previous live stream, was when on the third night the narrative that the cathedral was spinning concerning these riots kind of fell through. They realized that this was getting too violent. Uh, At that point, I think about three people had died in various instances, and there was one prominent video of a person, a man that was uh, beat within an inch of his life. Um, And uh, it was very disturbing, uh, very disturbing for anyone who watched it. And I think the cathedral, the the establishment media, and the the, the basically the well-to-do opinion, they got afraid of this, and then the next day, the next day, a narrative started that it was white supremacists. <laughs> the FBI, the FBI and, and the, the hardworking unelected bureaucrats of our government, the, the listening posts, had discovered secret communique of intentions of, of the, the, the Ku Klux Klan and, and, and various new Nazi organizations to frame, to frame well-intentioned progressives for the crime of violence and looting. And this was a, this was a giant psyops operation by, by the secret white supremacist power, the worldwide white supremacist power organizations, which as we well know, uh, prominent member Count Dankula is, 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 is our best suspect for tracking down this giant conspiracy of white supremacists to, to frame Antifa for these problems. And so I was just I was just looking at um I was looking at these uh, these news sources MSNBC and CNN, and and these these people would come on and they they'd say things like first of all they'd give they'd be in an interview, the first part of the interview would be just them dropping credentials about how they've had all these government jobs and all this, and then and then eventually they would get onto the fact that, well we know anarchists are planning to show up to these rallies. And like probably white supremacists are with them too because they are all about this. And we, we have someone on 4chan that mentioned something like this. And then they, and you can tell that they have no evidence and this, this stuff about white supremacy is just essentially a hypothetical being dumped on the back end of real evidence they have that Antifa and, and other leftist organizations are kind of colluding to stage these large-scale dramatic confrontations with police. Um, but they're running with this. And what's so strange is that in my experience from social media, from limited interaction since we're under quarantine, uh, progressives are buying this. They're they're buying this. I'm seeing people repeat that the murders and the looting that's going on is communicated by secret neo-Nazi white supremacists, apparently, which look black now. I, I guess maybe they're on blackface. Like that's a thing. Like they they they're going around looting these places because. <laughs> I, I I can't keep up with this stuff anymore, but um, I, I don't know. And I think through it all, I think the, the difficulty you know, with a lot of these things is is 
the left is really operating with this idea that they're working from the script of civil rights. They're, and the, the idea of civil rights was, you know, America was in a place in 1965. It was very rich. It was very high trust. It had no, I mean, there was the Soviet Union, but I think that even at that time, people realized that the Soviet Union, while a military risk, and certainly a military risk to the second and third worlds, it was certainly not a contender for global opinion and and for the, the narrative that would sort of rule the international community. Although I, I imagine, I mean, there there were some real risks from that. And, uh, and obviously, we almost went to war in, in the early 60s. We almost actually had a nuclear confrontation. But, but America was in a certain place where white America in particular felt like that it was on the top of the world and it was ruling everything and everything was swell. And, and into this, there was the fact of de jure racism, the fact that there were actual institutional obstacles to integration that were literally keeping the races apart. Uh, good or bad, they existed. They existed in law and they existed in judicial precedent. These things no longer exist in any meaningful way. They don't exist in any way that white America can tear them down. And furthermore, white America isn't in this secure position where it can just, it feels like it's on top of the world calling the shots. Uh, my experience, and this is going to be the experience of most white Americans in the situation is we've been essentially in house rest for two months. For two months, we've been living a very, very low standard of living. We've had zero contact with anybody. We've had to wear face masks around everywhere. We've had to keep our eyes to the ground, obey the regulations, do what the nice officers say. Don't ask any questions because that could spread the virus, right? Any any attempt to question the parameters of the curfew were asked when it will be over or to question its effect on small business was immediately, at least in the mainstream media, quashed because of the fact that this was breaking rank with the narrative that we needed to save lives. And I'm somewhat sympathetic to that. But now this week, that narrative's gone. We've, we've totally forgotten about social distancing and mask wearing. And, and we're just burning the motherfucker down. Like, we're just burning it all down. I mean, now the people out there in these densely packed mobs having fist fights with each other, those are the forefront of social justice and responsible reactions to to the George Floyd death. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think middle America is going to buy this. I, I, I guess never say never when it comes to people who has who have very, very tight controls on the institutions that control consensus, the consensus making apparatuses of our world. But man, I don't I don't see how anyone how, how white America is really buying this or or Middle America is really buying this. And uh, I don't want to say that the left has made a miscalculation on this one. But I, I don't know how the narrative is really going to work. Nothing seems to make sense anymore. And we're just in this in this sort of crazy land mode of 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 one side one side of the media apparatus has one thing one thing and the other side says the other. And, and and so this is gonna be, I mean, is this is this the new normal? The new normal is going to be Corruption in an corruption or murders in a police department somewhere in America means riots everywhere, and everyone's on permanent house arrest until we get a handle on a virus that we still somehow, even three or four months after the pandemic started, we still don't have a good handle on how this virus, how how lethal this virus is to your average American, and how much we need to worry about this virus spreading inside a reasonably locked down metropolitan area we still do not have a very good handle on this oh i mean i think people are worried about the stability of this country falling apart it really has everything to do with the fact that nobody trusts the institutions that are telling them this stuff anymore and and, and they really shouldn't oh man i i'm looking at myself in, in the mirror and I, this white light's just <laughs> it's, it's brutal I, I think i gain like five years in, in this in this harsh white light um so i know i said this but the whiskey it's uh crown royale, crown royale. Ca crown, that's the canadian whiskey isn't it don't call it scotch <laughs> it's oh okay oh it's, it's called scotch and it's made in scotland 
no, but it's a. Oh, I'm talking to someone off camera, but apparently. You can't call it scotch if it's not made in Scotland. But is this not scotch style? If whiskey is whiskey, but whiskey made in Scotland is scotch. Okay, I think my wife is a purist, but. Um, um, anyway. Um, all right, so I, I should probably just start answering some super chats. I'm sure. So I had a whole plan for this live stream, and it just went completely out the window once once my internet went down. I don't know what to say. Um, okay, so I have um, so carried over from the last stream, which probably will have to be taken down since it's literally unwatchable. Um, I have four super chats. I'm going to go work through them right now. Hopefully, um, hopefully we will be able to. Hopefully we'll be able to renormalize the stream and make it something that's at least somewhat watchable <laughs> after after we go live. Again, it, you know what's also so funny is that I don't remember ever having internet problems in this house. But since I've been working remotely for two months now, the internet's periodically gone down and it's taken down meetings I've had with actual real work. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I don't actually do YouTube for a living. Um, I'm very grateful for that, but I am also grateful for the super chats. So, um, again, thank you very much in advance. Uh, you know, you can see the very frumpy quarantine look that I've got going on here. Um, but okay. So Emmett five for $10. Thank you very much. Do you think the cathedral will take this opportunity to bury Antifa and to cover its tracks? Many of my normie friends are condemning Antifa and that seems to be the current narrative on the ground. Well, I mean, that's tough, isn't it? Um, the problem with the cathedral attacking its left flank is that at least since the 1960s, and I think, or at least since, I should say, at least since, yeah, I'd say since the 1960s. Since the 1960s, it's bit, the people in the cathedral, so the cathedral is essentially the consensus-making apparatus of our society in the West. But but since the, since the late 1960s and 1970s, People in the mainstream consensus-making apparatus of the society have realized that American society continuously moves left, which most institutions naturally do because of, of sort of the principles that Mencius Mulbug talks about. Uh, these institutions continuously move left. And, and at this point, our leaders are aware of this. So it, it is very likely that people are going to be trying to throw Antifa under the bus the typical strategy that I've seen is is to do this little leftist thing where where they start equivocating over the word, like oh well, Antifa is just anyone who calls themselves anti-fascist, you know, not understanding that these people organize online, they have a uniform, they coordinate inside Discord servers, <laughs> they they coordinate on Twitter. Uh, these things all exist; they're all realities. We everyone can recognize when Antifa is a place and. They have a strategy. They have rules that they coordinate with. Um, and, and of course, but, you know, who cares about that? Because Antifa is just a word. And so therefore, if it's just a word, it can't be an organization. And how can you, how can you, how can you possibly condemn a word, let alone a word that's so undisputably good as anti-fascist? Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe they'll try to do this. And I think there's going to be an attempt to sort of linguistically evade the problem by by doing what progressives usually do, pretending that the word they used for themselves a few months ago is just something that was made up by the the right wing to smear them. That's that's their, their classic MO on these matters. But the problem with, you know, if you're if you're someone in the cathedral, if you're somebody, let's say you're contrapoints, right? Or, or Lindsay Ellis. So I don't know. We're, we're using a YouTube example, but everyone here is watching YouTube, right? So you all know, you know, the cathedral has a presence. So insofar as the mainstream liberal progressive narrative that we would call the cathedral, insofar as it has a voice on YouTube, it is Lindsay Ellis, the nostalgia trick, the nostalgia chick and contrapoints. They're, they're guys, right? They're the ones that get the New York Times articles, the, the ones that get the Economist interviews, they're the ones that de-radicalize all of the right-wing youth that, that are been led astray by the alt-right white supremacist menace. Those are their guys. Now, if you're 
you know, if you're a 50 year old or a 60 year old person, you, know, you can go ahead and condemn Antifa and the communists. You don't care, right? You're not going to be working in 20 years, right? I mean, this is, and communism is not going to become mainstream in 10 years, right? Or it's not going to become mainstream enough to fire you without a huge political upheaval, you know? So, um, but if you're in your 30s, like Nostalgia Chick and uh, ContraPoints, um, condemning Antifa or communists is hugely problematic because like everyone else who's had contact with the cathedral through the university system since the 1960s, you know that the cathedral, the consensus, moves in one direction and in an accelerating speed, and that direction is left. So if you're thinking about your career 10, 20 years ahead of time, you're looking at people like Vaush and going, hmm, do I throw him under the bus and then figure out that he's the one that's speaking to all the youth in 10 years? That's a problem. This is one thing that the right doesn't do because no one in National Review has any, no one in National Review for one second thinks that Nick Fuentes is going to be their boss in 20 years. I mean, maybe he will, like maybe he will have a historically uncommon event and reactionaries will actually get the whip hand over the conservatives and there'll be a, a basically an upheaval of the political order in counter progressive and non-progressive political arrangements maybe that will happen but no what jonah goldberg does not think that nick fuentes is going to be his boss in 20 years he doesn't think that nick fuentes is going to be someone who's going to be applying for his job in 30 years right he doesn't think that's going to happen so he has he doesn't care if he has to throw him under the bus let alone someone like richard spencer who's obviously mercurial and incapable of leadership you know nick fuentes i mean if, if nick fuentes were on the left if, if this were a young up-and-coming guy who was a little edgy but knew how to dress right and could speak really really well um you know the new york times would be bending he could say anything he wanted that was radical or even violent the new york times and everyone else who was under 40 who had to get who had to worry about who was in power in 20 years would be bending over backwards to try to accommodate that guy uh, it, it's the fact that our society tends to move to the left, which has assured people in the mainstream conservative side of things that they're never going to have to really worry about Nick Fuentes and they can safely counter signal against him. So I don't know. I, I think that what you're going to likely see is you're going to let Emmett uh, to answer your question. What you're likely going to see is you're going to likely see the left trying to throw Antifa under the bus in meaningless ways like the debt, like Antifa, like the classic way to throw it under the bus in meaningless ways, like, well, Antifa doesn't really mean anything. Sure, there's like bad actors, but it's just individuals. It doesn't mean anything. Okay, so yeah, that was a little bit of a hiccup. Hopefully not something that actually um, disrupted the stream. Okay, uh, looks like we're back. I'm saying that we're back. So I'm going to wait around until we are actually back. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, it seems like most people are seeing this still, so I'm going to keep on going on to the other Super Chats. Um, okay, so here we go. So for... <laughs> um, so I'm going I'm to do the Super Chats from the previous stream. Uh, so the previous stream Super Chats are um, still going. Give me a second. I had to reload my browser and I apparently lost the mail. Okay, so not today for $2 says, today you can say the gamer word, Dave. Um, well, thank you for your contribution. I actually don't know what you mean by that. So um, then we have the Wooster for $2. Will this finally wake white liberals up? Well, this is the question of the hour, right? And I guess white liberals really have two components to them. They have the component that is sort of the, the central center right kind, like the Sargonites. And then you have people like, um, you have people like, well, I'm not to, I mean, my parents and, and other people who are in the center left. The difficulty with liberals is that I think the centrists as a demographic, they are completely dominated, if not by boomer bodies, by boomer money. And I know everyone's accusing me of boomer tech skill. I don't think an internet outage is boomer tech skill. Uh, I, I blame it on the ISP, at least this time. Maybe not having a backup computer is a, is a classic boomer move. And I, I guess I'm guilty of that. 
Um, but but the thing is, is that the, the, the liberal apparatus, its institutions, it's backed by boomer money and boomer leadership. So until they retire, and they are starting to retire now, so it's not out of the question that it could start happening at any moment. Until the leaders retire, the main assumptions of that side is are, are they're not going to get questioned, and um, it's it's something that I think it's hard to see that if you're not political and you live your life, if you've lived your life in a way that you predominantly remember the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, politics is kind of secondary for you. It's a thing that you can take it or leave it. It's not something that predominantly defines your identity like it does for many people in this generation. I mean, obviously, my identity is predominantly religious and, and I guess cultural to a certain extent too. But but I think you know if you look at the boomers, they're, they're much more professionally conscious. They're much more artistically conscious and for that reason they lean a lot more on their institutions and they don't really look around them and see that a lot of their assumptions about how things operate are going right out the window um and this this instance with minneapolis right now is obviously one of them what's going on like narratively explain what's happening to me the narrative was america was locked down we were all in this together and then suddenly one day for no reason we just burnt the motherfucker down. We just burnt it down. How, as academic agent says, how under the boomer truth regime does this make any sense? You cannot tell yourself the story of the last four months with the coronavirus lockdown, and you're you're a criminal if you uh, if you walk your dog without a mask, and then. The, the supreme justice of those who 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 get into a giant mob and and raid target and burn down housing projects and, and be people um that doesn't make any sense whatsoever and so there there's there's no way you can look at this there there are, there are, I, I should before i say that this is going to be like a slam dunk red pill I mean, there there are far left ways of making this narrative make sense, and there are far right ways of making this narrative make sense, but there are very very few comfortable centrist ways of making this whole narrative make sense. I, I guess you know, and maybe I'm I'm doing the centrist a disservice here. I understand if I look at people like Friended and PSA Sitch that there are many centrists who apparently do look at this stuff, and and their reaction is, oh well. The system needs massive systematic change, um, but centrism is still the answer. So this is the problem with centrism. Centrism, you know, centrism does make a certain amount of, you know, Mantis Molbuck had this thing about centrism never making sense, but it, but it kind of does. Like if you're on a boat and you want to maintain the status quo, uh, you know, we are in a system of checks and balances, both institutionally and also politically. So you can see that if you like the status quo and you think that the systems are not systematically mendacious, you think that they're mostly truthful, and you think that the government is self-correcting, then centrism makes sense not so much as a political ideology, but as a way of not rocking the boat, as making sure that the status quo maintains itself into the future. Um, but once we once we admit that our institutions are systematically mendacious, that they're telling lies, and that they are essentially, there's no way to tell the story without the the system in some way conspiring, either to create an unnecessary riot or to create an unnecessary panic over the COVID virus. There's no story you can tell that doesn't admit to one of those flaws, which means that at some level our system is entirely mendacious and perverse. But then the centrist has a problem because in order for a centrist solution, like in order for a centrism not to be a status quo centrism, but to be a solution centrism, again, then you fall into sort of the Mencius mole bug problem with centrism. Then you have to get, then you have to embrace ideological centrism. And, and that is literally believing that for some reason, this very second, you yourself have come to the very Goldilocks moment in human history. And at this moment, your positions, which are at the center of the political sphere right now, again, they'll be considered radically to the left for any previous generation, and they'll be considered radically to the right uh, for any subsequent generation, most likely, unless we're going into a collapse mode. 
um, this centrist position is the correct one ideologically. Uh, this seems to be very difficult to believe. It was very difficult to believe uh, when when people were talking about it in in the in the sixties, and it's very difficult. It's even more difficult to believe now. And because of this, um, you know, I think PSA Stitch and Friended and Sargon. Well, Sargon a little bit less so because I think he's slowly moving to the right uh, glacially. <laughs> academic agent is basically well, ba academic agent's right wing at this stage. Um, his liberalism is more or less just a preference as far as I'm concerned, which I think is perfectly fine to have. I have some liberal sympathies myself, um, although not really ideologies. But but let's say PSA, Sitch, and Friended, they're in an impossible situation. They know the system is absolutely unstable and therefore needs correction. And, they, and they're trying to find some ideologically centrist position. Um, the position almost certainly does not exist. And what's worse is they they have a hard time going back and finding support for this. The best they can do is go back and, and sort of cherry pick certain things from every ideology that they think are particularly comforting, but that are not extreme. Um, but that's difficult. You can't find, say for just, just basic moral systems having to do with our notions of equality and right and wrong. You know, friended is all about this objective morality thing. Um, you can't go back more than a hundred years, and and get to some kind of secular humanitarian morality. Uh, so if our problems didn't start in the last five decades, which is, I think, it's a little bit hard to believe that they started. I mean, I guess you could make the case they started in the '60s, but then you have to ask yourself why did the '60s happen, and so on and so forth. But but if all if our problems didn't all start in the last four or five decades, then at some point we're retreating to what would be considered a radically right-wing and a non-secular point of view, or a point of view that is massively caught up in some concept like nationalism or to pick a buzzword from the left, to sort of academic magic word, essentialism. It, it, any ideology you take to, to correct yourself in that direction is going to be necessary for, necessarily very radical. And, and I guess the same, similar but different propositions follow in the leftward direction. Um, the left has already taken on board every radical idea it possibly can that does not directly impact its power apparatus. All of the stuff that was intersectionality, identity politics, black nationalism, all of that stuff that was popular in, the Ber in Berkeley in the 90s under the purview of being a radical, a radical critical theory, all that stuff is mainstream now. I bet you couldn't find very many journalists under the age of 30 in the New York Times or CNN or The Economist or the San Francisco Chronicle that disagreed with intersectionality or anything that Judith Butler ever said. And that probably has never existed. Or not, not, it probably has not existed in the last three years. Uh, obviously, in the 90s it existed, which is exactly the trend I'm pointing to. Um, so all, all of the radical cultural stuff is already mainstream. Now, the, the Chronicle and the Times understand that they can't print that opinion right now, uh, but, but there is nobody in the mainstream that doesn't hold it. Uh, the only opinions that are sort of radical in the sense that the current leaders of institutions don't hold them are sort of the radical revolutionary and anarchist ones that are, well, I mean, everybody knows outside of BreadTube that things like the labor theory of value is pretty much economic bunk and leads to no good ideas about how to actually manage an economy and 10,000 bad ones. And their attempt to implement this co-op scheme is is ridiculous. And then we might get into this a little bit later. Um, but uh, they're, yeah. And, and, and so, but, but that's what you need to believe and advocate for to be radical because the intersectionality stuff, that's already ContraPoints. That's already the New York Times. That's already in the the circle of the leaders. So, um, you you and, and so you know this is the problem with the leftist centrist is that they can't draw on radical ideas because the left's already co opted them. They have to be part of the problem at this stage. I see more super chats, guys. I'm getting around to them. Just let me finish the uh, ones that were given before the stream. I'll try to. I see more of them, so I'm going to go through them a little bit faster if you don't mind. Ah, the last one from the aborted stream. Steel, steel bonnet 86 for 
Academic Agent saw all of this as a case for balkanization. It feels like a pipe dream, excuse me. It feels like a pipe dream, but how much closer do you think this has brought us to that? Um, to be quite honest, it, it balkanization is a low probability proposition at any time uh, because there is a military in this country and the military has nuclear weapons seated around this country that it's not going to give up. That it's, it's not going to cede nuclear weapons to militias or to, or to state troopers. And because of that, um, there will always be the chance to take the whole tamale, so to speak, by controlling the U.S. military and controlling the security apparatuses of this country. Obviously, you know, from a reactionary point of view, from a right-wing point of view, uh, balkanization seems like the best idea because what we want to have happen is we want to have progressives own their own mistakes. We want to say, okay, guys, you fix this in your space and we'll have law and order in ours and we'll see how well this all plays out. And I mean, we know how this works. Um, progressives have no solutions to this, right? Berkeley and Oakland and these progressive utopias, at least in my state, these are the most unequal places probably in the entire United States. It's a very, very rich white people living right next to very, very poor black and brown people. Uh, we know progressives don't have a solution to this, at least a solution that they want to implement. And, uh, and, and the balkanization or federalization would help them when it comes to terms with that. The problem is, is that our institutions since at least the 1930s have been entirely nationalized and have been set up to maintain that national power. The cathedral knows this. The cathedral in its modern iteration was created by this very federalization. It was created, the, the modern iteration was created by FDR's brain trust. And, and so they understand that they're playing for everything. And so uh, I think that's going to prevent balkanization. In many ways, if I, if I were cynical and I've tweeted this, uh, you could see this entire uh, freak out over police violence. You could see this entire freak out over, out of, this freak out over police violence uh, being an instance of the cathedral realizing that it was weak and wanting to essentially bring the police forces, which have always been something that they didn't control, uh, closer, the control of the police departments, closer to their consensus-making apparatus in the State Department, in the media, in the university system. If every police department in America has to have uh, a commissar attaché that oversees their operations, that would be a major victory for the cathedral because they would be able to ensure in a very, very real way, that the police departments were always on side with the narrative, regardless of how crazy they were about their demands for, again, you know, <laughs> proportional black arrests in the face of disproportional black crime. So I would love it, and I'd love to work towards it, but I mean, it would need the model for a balkanization or some separation would need to look different in kind than the kind of neo-confederate plans that keep that keep on getting cooked up by far-right militia movements and and propertarians like um was it john was john mark the guy who constantly talks about balkanization and civil war uh they need to be different than that because that's not going to happen in a nation that has a massive military force and nuclear weapons plus uh plus a consensus making apparatus that is very very keen on not letting uh, disintegration happen. Um, you know, people, the, the, the cathedral knows that it, it, nothing, it does make sense. I mean, it's known that for a while, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but let's get to the actual, I mean, for the time being, since I'm so far behind, I might as well just, uh, read super chats. Excuse me. Um, I think that will sort of lead to interesting conversations. I'd like to go for at least an hour and a half because, uh, you know, I, I, again, I apologize for the false start, but, uh, you know, I hate it when that happens. Um, so Travis hammer for $10. Do you think people will just move on from this or is this the last spit in the face? I think that's what everyone's asking. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think they'll move on from this. If this is, if they think this is not going to happen again, but the problem is 
I mean, okay, I, I guess we have to analyze this from each side. If you listen to progressives, they're like, no more. We're not going to just move on from this. Uh, this has There has to be a qualitative change about how this is being managed in our society. Um, sure. Uh, but uh, what's your solution? They, I mean, progressives have been talking about this Black Lives Matter stuff for, for well, I mean, since 2012 now. I mean, it's been almost a decade at this stage. And the amount of policy proposals they have in light of this are just shockingly small. Uh, their policy proposals, insofar as they're implementable for the time being, amount to essentially removing discretional policing from black neighborhoods. Or to try to inject more ideology into police departments, uh, which is, I think, what they really, really want. They want, essentially, commissars to rule police departments, which is, you know, I, I'm sure at some point they'll come out with this plan. Um, but but I don't know. That doesn't seem like it's an actual solution. That's hard to sell, right? That's hard to sell, like, oh, yeah, the solution to cops shooting black people is diversity officers at, that have higher positions inside cop departments. Even for people like Joe Biden, that feels like a transparent attempt to accrue political power inside the government. And I think Americans won't buy it. And the radical left certainly won't buy it. The radical left is not angry at this particular murder. They're angry at the system of, well, everything. They're, they're angry at capitalism. They're also angry at whiteness, whatever that means. And they want to tear it all down and they want to burn everything down uh, in, in classical bio Leninist fashion. Um, so, you know, they're not going to be satisfied with these halfway measures. So I don't know. I don't, I don't see any plan coming out of the left to make sure this doesn't happen again. And then the right's solution for making this plan not happen again is to, I don't know, completely disempower the left. <laughs> The thing they've been incapable of doing for the last 30 years, the, the last time the left felt like it was on the back foot was probably the early 90s, maybe the mid 90s. And since that time, the left has been assured that the, the right had essentially no way to institutionally hurt any of their main power apparatuses. And because of that, they felt no, no desire to compromise. They knew that they're going left. They knew that all the institutions are going to go left. So why compromise with the right? You know where the future is going to go. And this has only been buttressed by the demographic reality that everyone's coming face to face with and that Joe Biden is very, very fond of talking about explicitly. Uh, they, they know where the demographics are going and they're not going in the Republicans' favor. So that means, in addition to this, that normie solutions to this problem, e.g., charging the police officer and then trying to reinstall law and order, that's not going to be accepted. So I guess, I, I don't think that if this were a one-off incident, it would be the final spit in the face. This might be the final spit in the face only if Americans realize that the spit will never stop, that this is going to be a pattern of affairs that will continue on and on and on that their children will deal with this, that their children's children will deal with this um, on into the future. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is kind of what depresses me about this whole thing. Uh, I, I've said before, you know, reparations, which is sort of the stupidest idea ever. I mean, even me as a reactionary, um, if I could be assured that no further reparations would be ever asked of any of my descendants, um, upon paying reparations, I'd probably be in favor of paying reparations being, being done with it. But but you know that if we gave the left every one of its demands, they would be back the next day with twice as many demands because they're not interested in a particular policy resolution to this problem. They're interested in completely destroying the power apparatus of any right-wing or non-progressive force that could possibly stand in their way. Uh, they want a totalization of the narrative and they want a totalization of power. And so these reforms are not designed to solve the problem. In fact, they're designed to not solve the problem. Uh, diversity officers inside police, uh, police offices or localization of policing will not stop the fact that African Americans commit a disproportionate number of murders, which means that the complaints of people living inside these communities will persist regardless of whether any reforms are implemented. And because of that, the Democrats have their hands on an unsolvable problem. 
And I think what the 20th century has taught us, and this is sort of the most malignant thing that the 20th century has taught us, and in many ways it's what neo-reaction largely reacts to, is that unsolvable problems can be a continuous generator of political power. Once you have an unsolvable problem on your hands and your opposition is constitutionally incapable of addressing it in a way that, that they can make political hay out of, then just by going back to that problem, reemphasizing how bad it is, and then going to the public for more, for more uh, you can constantly open up new sinecures, new jobs for your friends. You can constantly win elections on this. Uh, global warming is never going to be solved, but there will constantly be an, a need for new funding for the solution to global warming. Uh, the problem of African-American disproportional arrests and jailings and, and prison time and sentencing, that will never be solved short of a massive cultural change, and maybe not even that, that will never be solved. And because of that, because we can't talk about realities in play, um, because they're vetoed from our conversation. Um, we can't we can we can't say that the, that the problem is unsolvable. At the same time, the solutions don't work. So we just complete we always double down with more money, and uh, the power continuously centralizes inside the progressive power apparatus. Um, that's how the machine works. It's brilliant, and uh, yeah, I don't think it's going away. I think the, the the last spit in the face is going to be when people realize that's that's happening. Okay, uh, Julian Sabash, uh, for $10, I love your thoughtful videos. As a libertarian, this past week and month have really added red-black pills as to how the general populace is just not ready for a Roth Rothbardian society without a cultural shift. I mean, well, that's certainly true. And um, I might as well just finish this. Well, that's certainly true. And um, I think this is sort of, uh, I mean, God, I feel like a hack sometimes talking about Thomas Carlyle because it's essentially, I'm essentially doing what uh, Molebug um, did. But it, it really does bring you back to people like Burnham and, and Carlyle. The idea that we should focus on liberty is misguided when it's obvious that liberty only stems from high trust societies that are experiencing social order. You cannot implement liberty in a society that does not have high trust social institutions and that does not have a government that maintains social order, as we are currently completely incapable of generating. Coronavirus has, to a large degree, very much undermined our public trust in institutions, certainly the institutions that were originally designed or originally designed and put in charge of addressing this problem. And, and furthermore, it's, it's shown that the government can take any amount of power to solve the problem, even though it's incapable or incompetent of properly assessing the solutions <laughs> to solving the problem. First, it's no masks, then it's masks. Uh, it takes it too much to shut down the border uh, because the narrative it was promoting before that <laughs> said that, it, that no shutting down of any border was ever possible for any reason. But apparently sitting on the border is possible, and we did it, like every country can do and does. And so, uh, but, but what this has shown us is that we don't have a high trust society. Uh, we have a low, lower trust society than we did in 1965. And year by year, it's getting lower and lower and lower. I don't know how low it can go. Probably we're headed towards a society that has trust and order levels that look more like Brazil, even though we'll be much, much richer, thank God. Or maybe not, thank God, because the richness, the wealth, is essentially allow, going to allow us to take a large amount of decadence and entropy, which means that we're going to have even more order, less, we're going to even have less order and less social trust. Okay, so as a libertarian, you have to ask yourself this. I mean, let's just do, let's be an engineer about this, right? Uh, engineers do a lot of things called root causing. You have a problem and then you ask yourself, okay, what caused this problem, right? And usually what you do is you ask yourself what caused the problem until you can get to something either that is an explicit sort of act of God thing, like weather or just random chance that you have no control over, or you get it back to something that you do have control over and then you fix that thing. 
Okay, so, so let's do this. So if liberty depends on social order and social trust, what creates societies that have high social trust and social order? Um, obviously, it's common ethics, common morality, and the teaching of those ethics and morality in a way where people actually put them into effect in their own lives, right? Okay, so let's reconcile it again. Why don't we have common morality and common teaching of morality? Well, it's because our culture doesn't believe in common morality anymore. It believes in institutional authority and vague aphorisms like humanism and diversity, replacing strict principles of things like strict principles of things like honesty and cohesion and and tradition. Uh, and so, so what you see here is you see that well, I, I guess we have in some sense root caused it in the sense that we need to develop institutions that teach morality and create communities that uphold morality and ethics and high trust, at least microcosmically. The major institutions, the government, the government institutions do not do this currently. And so we have a situation uh, where, where we need to create an alternative or retake those inst institutions, which will be very, very difficult. Um, this gets to the core prom problem we're facing in modernity itself, and that is the fact that modern man in his secular form seems to have turned his back on the metaphysical groundings that could possibly underline a return towards a strong moral system. And I think that the postmodern step, or maybe the metamodern step, I don't, I don't really know what metamodernism is, but the postmodern step needs to be the unironic and sincere embrace of truth, goodness, and beauty in some way that is considered societally objective. Now, I know a friend it has this penchant for arguing over mor whether morality is objective in some absolute metaphysical sense. I think this is more or less the equivalent of arguing over whether God exists. And while I think that there are good reasons to believe God exists if you accept a lot of other premises, um, there's certainly nothing forcing you to accept that God exists. I think it is, in the end, a choice. But at any rate, if our communities are not trying to reconsolidate on a central premise that generates a sincere embrace of truth, goodness, and beauty that can be shared in between people and inside of a community, then I think our larger political goals are probably not going to go anywhere. We need to have that first step. Um, now, of course, political goals can be developed in parallel. As most people know, this is not predominantly a religious channel. This is a channel that concerns itself with political theory. But but I, I always go back to religion and poetry and art and all of these things that we... I mean, the reason why I go back to poetry, art, and religion is because uh, these are things that if we're consuming them in the right way, and this is what distinguishes them from entertainment... If we're consuming these things in the right way, we're consuming them in an unironic fashion. And this is something that I think and even in modern entertainment, this is something, you know, this is what boomer culture had that millennial culture doesn't have. And this is what kind of leads to what Mark Fisher talks about in his capitalist realism concept is that when you go back to the original like 1980s properties like Star Wars and Ghostbusters and Back to the Future, these were pop culture phenomenons they were somewhat humorous but they were entirely sincere whereas their modern remake iterations they're constantly sarcastic and even the people who defend them even the people who defend the star wars sequels a few moments aside and the moments that they do defend is sincere are explicit flatterings of their political preconceptions a few moments aside like that they they embrace them in this weird kind of sarcastic ironic sense you know it's, it's hard to really explain um, so, uh, so I think we've lost that, right? Uh, we have to go back to these forms of art, like fine art or poetry or and religion, which is not an art, but is something, but, but those things, what those things have in common is they can only be consumed properly in a mode of sincerity. And if you're not consuming them sincere, sincerely, you're doing something almost sacrilegious, there was a movie, Dead Poets Society, that came out in the 80s, and um, it was kind of, it was, it's totally boomer. It's, it's a very cringe movie, in my opinion. I apologize if that's someone's favorite movie. 
but uh, I'm going on a tangent here to kind of illustrate this, is um, it's about these kids in this boarding school in the 1960s, right? And their, their, their establishmentarian teachers won't let them do what they want. They're all about staying in school and becoming a doctor or a lawyer or, or a CPA and you know, all that stuff. Like they're the stodgy, dead white male people, uh, don't color outside of the line, don't think independently. And of course, they get Robin Williams, who's their their English literature teacher. And he opens up the world of Walt Whitman and and. and Alfred Lord Tennyson and all of these things. And they start thinking romantically. Um, they, they start thinking in the mode of these early 19th century uh, thinkers. And they, they, they create the Dead Poet Society, which is supposed to be this, and the way Robert Williams describes it is, it's supposed to be the society that sucks the marrow out of life and, and lives life to the fullest. Carpe diem, seize the day because tomorrow you'll die. Oh, that's sort of the, the, the motion of this thing. Um, I mean, the difficulty, though, is is this is not the this is not the um, this is not indeed the early nineteenth century. Uh, the establishmentarians of the nineteen sixties would not, for instance, uh, disown their son for acting in a Shakespeare play. Um, that's something that you might get, you know, a patriarch from the eighteen. 1817, maybe a patriarch would do that. Uh, in in 1965, it's ridiculous and stupid and, and kind of cringy. Uh, moreover, but but more than just sort of the the establishmentarianism, like the 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 rebelliousness of reading romantic poetry, kind of not being commensurate with with the setting in the 20th century. Um, the other thing that kind of rings hollow is that the kids, being 1960s teenagers are way more cynical than their 19th century romantic counterparts. So when they, they, when they steal off to read these poems in the woods, um, it, it has kind of this like jokey quality to it, right? It has this kind of jokey, like, oh, we're just doing some bad stuff. We're being bad kids, you know? And they never, it never sounds like they are dedicating their souls to the poetry that they're reading in a sincere way, uh, which is, which which is means that they're not really participating in 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 the romantic revolution the way that the people of the romantic era uh really were and that always struck me as kind of like that always struck me a dead poet society always struck me as the revolution of romanticism um doesn't make sense in the 60s because that wasn't the struggle that the revolutionaries in the 60s fought and in a large degree that was because the revolutionaries in the 60s um uh, they, they were they were even even by their own uh, more idealistic standards uh, they they were still too cynical to to really read those poems sincerely and, and I wonder maybe after we get done with all of this stuff we we kind of come through the eye of the needle we emerge on the opposite end with the ability to read something like romantic poetry like Byron and and not like just smirk at it not like crack jokes or, or get self-conscious i don't know but but it has to be starting with something like that uh so thank you for the question julian um going on to the next super chat spaghetto for five dollars people were saying police not wearing masks were doing it on purpose to genocide blacks with coronavirus it's been hard to believe it's been hard to not be angry these days yeah this kind of reminded me of a tweet that Academic Agent had on his... I'm going to check my Twitter here. I don't have this set up to show. Um, I think um, Academic Agent had... Uh, had. Um, I think it was a retweet from CNN, which said, uh, CNN would like to remind protesters that... Um, and this is in the middle when they're burning down <laughs> neighborhoods in Minneapolis. It's, it's Please remember... Please remember to stay safe and, and wear a face mask. <laughs> um, yeah, if you're worried about black bodies contracting the coronavirus, then black bodies shouldn't densely be packed in riot scenarios burning down their own neighborhoods. I mean, it's just, again, it's just, it's so, it's so Twilight Zone bizarre that you can't take any of this seriously. Um yeah, I mean, you can't take this seriously if you have an inquisitive mind, but maybe you know, maybe we have to come to the terms with the fact that people just don't ask themselves these questions, that, that this is the living example of the Pareto distribution, that this is just going to be, 
a minority of people who are asking questions in this way and, and getting answers that um, make sense. Anyone, at least anyone who's been thinking more or less on, on your average curious level, who sees the last four months of media narrative, no one can come away with this thinking that the, the media is not completely mendacious and completely deceptive. So, um, red six UA for $2. Is there any way to greatly harm the cathedral? Um, yeah, I mean, the cathedral is not going to die. Uh, I mean, but it, it's going to lose power and it's going to lose resources. And when it loses power and resources, it's going to have a harder time striking out at people. I guess this is the hope, right? The hope is that the cathedral is going to get so weak and backed into a corner it's not going to have time to strike out at people, at right-wingers, at least right-wingers who manage their optics correctly. Of course, the cathedral is going to strike back at people who look like um, Blues Brothers Nazis. That's easy. That, that's not even hard for it to do. That, that doesn't hurt the cathedral. That helps it, right? <clears throat> um, but, but the hope is that the cathedral is going to get weak enough so that it doesn't have time to strike out against people who look like, say, for instance, Brittany Pettibone and Martin Sellner. And I think the way to make the cathedral weaker, and it is making itself weaker by its own actions, the way to simultaneously defend yourself and to make the cathedral weaker is to get off of common narratives, contradict its narratives. What narrative does the media, the cathedral, the State Department want conservatives to have what do they want conservatives to say in the light of these riots? They want conservatives to go like, herder, law and order, law and order, police did nothing wrong, just get back in line. That, that's the narrative they want because then um, then liberals like, or not liberals, but, but progressives like the mayor of Minneapolis and really everyone else in between and um, all, of the, all of the socialist Democrats in the Senate or in, in Congress, they can all point to those stodgy conservatives and say, oh, hey, look, institutional white supremacy. Let's fight against that. Elect Bernie Sanders. We have got to stop them from having these opportunities. And this is one of the main reasons why I really wanted to urge people to be more neutral to this situation. We want to acknowledge what's, I mean, if you have to talk about the riots, and I guess I just did talk about the riots, always focus on the media contradictions. Don't, I really think people should avoid hand-wringing about the violence rioters cause. I think that plays into the narrative game that the media wants to play into. Focus on the temerity and mendacity of the media itself, how it's lying, how it's failing to cover things, Focus on the ineffectuality of institutions that are progressive to fix the problems and, and always center, always center the progressive side as the people who have failed. Um, this essentially helps hurt the cathedral because it puts it on the spot, embarrasses it. Molbug has this great passage from his essay, Communism and the Brown Scare, where he says, the point of when you attack the cathedral is not to attack the power apparatuses the cathedral has secured, but rather to embarrass and contradict it and make your story something that the cathedral itself cannot incorporate into its own entertainment product. Whenever you interact publicly with anything, ask yourself this simple question. If people will, if people, if, if progresses, if progressives were to, to just sort of superficially see what I'm doing or saying, would they have an easy time or a hard time incorporating this into a story or a movie that makes them look like the good guys? If the answer is this would be easy to incorporate into an entertainment product that would make progressives look like the good guys, uh, then don't do that thing. You always want to take a message and an optical perspective that makes it very, very difficult um, to very, very difficult for um, for for progressives to uh, 
to, to, to sort of shove you in a box that they already have uh, pre, pre-designed. And the law and order conservative that's trying to put down the protesters as, as savages, uh, they have that box designed. They've been using it since the Rodney King riots. It works great. It gets Democrats elected. Well, at least it gets Democrats elected in, in blue areas. Um, it's, it's not really going to hurt the cathedral. Uh, we need to come up with something that's different, a, a new narrative. I'm going to take a break here uh, since I see a, uh, a, a non-super chat question that's sort of related to this current question from a friend in the, um, in the chat uh, who asks, how do you explain the mendacity of the media without a deliberate conspiracy? Um, that's a good question, but I think it's actually easier than you're making it out to be. I think you should just say the media and the academy have failed us. They failed to live up to the standards that they constantly demand the rest of America live up to. Uh, I would say, I mean, it depends obviously who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody who's already seeing this and who's and who's kind of edging towards reactionary ideas, maybe bring them through some of the thought experiments that lead one to understand how Consensuses can develop that are not conspiracies, but are simply consensuses that are simply a reflection of how a certain group of people think in a certain area. Most of Mulbug's writing was simply bringing up examples. Most of reactionary writings, most of my career on YouTube is just bringing up examples. I was actually going to have, a, I can't remember if this is actually a Mulbugian example. I was going to release a video uh, soon that was going to go over um Another another thought experiment that would illustrate this if you have 20 minutes. But I mean, to be honest, I mean, like even if the even if the thought experiment is like a sort of trolley problem thing, even the thought experiments, 10 minutes of video with with animations and I'm not a very good animator. So it's going to be stick figures. But but even if it was a video that was well animated, uh, something that looked like I don't know, like uh, extra credits or something like that. Uh, I mean, a 10 minute video is not going to help you in a conversation with a coworker. Uh, these things are too fast. If it's a conversation with a coworker, uh, you, you got to just give them the you got to give them the sort of the media's failed us, the academy's failed us, the institutions of the State Department. I mean, and by that I mean like any government institution that's largely democratic and controlled by uh, people who who share staff with people who run the State Department. Those people have failed us, and just keep it at that. You're disappointed. You're worried about the future. You want order to be restored. You don't necessarily have the answers. We're not in a position where we can give answers because there's no answer that can be given without setting the groundwork for what's actually wrong. And they don't know what's wrong because they don't know. I mean, if they still trust the the academy to give them correct answers on questions that are political in nature, we haven't taken the right first steps in addressing this issue. So, I mean, there's that. Um, I'm going to keep on going with the Super Chats so I can actually finish at a reasonable time. I think we'll go on for another hour or something like that. Um, but that was a good extension of the Super Chat question from the chat. So I'm glad I had a chance to answer it. Again, um, the app replies are going to be catch as catch can while Super Chats persist because obviously I have to prioritize. <clears throat> okay, um, okay, I'm way behind here. Uh, how'd they get this so out of whack? You can blame me for this, um, losing my cursor. That's a boomer thing. Internet failing, not such a boomer thing, although I realize that it's very, very irritating um, signing, going up for a stream that's late because I'm on the West Coast and have to uh, put a young child down for bed. I understand that's irritating. So thank you again for uh, being patient with this stream. So Daniel Dawit for five dollars. Do you see a difference? Do you see a difference between? Um, do you see? Do you see a difference between white narratives and black narratives around these protests in the United States? Um, wow, this is the first easy question I think I've gotten this entire stream. I might mean, want to rob you out of your super chat money, but yeah, it's massively different. The white narrative. Okay, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say this to make it somewhat complicated. I mean, the white narrative is not really unified in any meaningful sense, right? Um, the white narrative uh, is divided. Uh, 
white people used to be a cohesive group in 1946. They're really not anymore. Most of the time when people say white America, they mean Gentiles who don't live in a few select urban areas and who don't have jobs in one of the apparatuses of the cathedral, e.g. media, academy, or um, or or high-level level managerial positions inside HR departments. That element of white American, that their narrative is, this is a law and order issue, how can I fix this problem? That narrative is different than... <clears throat> This instance, this this one police murder is a symbol for 300 years of white oppression. And our reaction to it has to embody the catharsis of that 300 years, which is largely the narrative that most black intellectuals and most woke white people uh, are taking towards this particular instance in Minneapolis, which of course is massively different from the narrative you'll see in most white communities. Or, well, again... I hate the word whiteness. In the narrative you'll see in most Gentile communities that aren't directly employed by the cathedral. Um, so I hope that helps. Okay, so here is the big one. Oh, is there even a question attached with this? Quo peregrinatrum for $50 is just a pure contribution. Um, gee, well, thanks very much. I, I'm, I would have spent a lot of time on this question had I known, had there been a question attached to it. Um, but thanks very much for the contribution. Um, yeah, I mean, times are a little tight. I'm not going to lie. You know, uh, uh, you know, I, I sort of suspended my solicitation of subscribe star fees for my videos when I went on hiatus. But it's turned out recently that this hiatus has been less of a hiatus hiatus and more just the new reality is that I can't consistently make videos because I have a family that depends on me. Uh, but I still kind of make videos on a semi-consistent basis. <laughs> uh, but I'm not done with the video that I've been planning for a long time on distributism because I wanted to write it out in the form of a small little like pamphlet or a small book that I could publish on Kindle um, or publish on the blog. Uh, and I constantly tear up my drafts. So it's going to take a really, really long time. So hiatus has meant that I'm not done with that project yet. And I don't want to say that I'm starting anything big before I finish that project. But but as it always works, I get new ideas and I want to get the ideas out before I forget them. So I'm constantly tempted to do smaller videos. Um, and, and I see no reason not to if I, if I have a few hours here or there, right? Uh, it just seems like a good use of time, I guess. I mean, I, I really, I, this is always the thing with me. And, and then I know this is something that sort of differed between me and, and people like Millennial Woes and, 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 and I think people like YouTubers like Fritz Imperial. Um, making videos does not feel like work to me. Uh, it feels like, it feels literally like playing a video game. Sometimes writing down my ideas can be frustrating in that I constantly have to tear up the drafts and I constantly have to correct myself. And sometimes pasting the pictures in after it's already recorded can be frustrating. Uh, but everything else having to do with thinking about this stuff and, and making the videos, this is just fun for me. So it, it almost feels bad taking money. But but thank you very much for the money because the family, uh, we, we need it. Um, so thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I mean, engineering salary is, it, it gets stretched a little bit thin even with a new kid. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, $5, if Trump declares martial law, is that a progressive victory or a setback? Oh, sorry. I forgot to read the name. Oh, oh and there was one more super chat. So thank you, Quo Peregrinator, for $50. Uh, Jen Karen for $200 South Korean. Thank you very much. I'm not sure how much money that is, but thank you very much. There's no question with that. And then Metal Lad 811 for $5 says, if Trump declares martial law, is that a progressive victory or a setback? Um, that would be a huge, huge, huge progressive victory, in my opinion. Um, that would be just the kind of thing they would need to completely destroy and remake the state uh, and remake the Department of Defense when they inevitably get back into power. The cathedral is weak, but it's not weak enough to have to tolerate martial law. So if martial law is declared temporarily, the left gets to grandstand on I told you so. And then when it inevitably, when civilian governments inevitably come back into power 
and martial law hasn't unseated the academy. It hasn't unseated the media. It hasn't actually seized the institutions of the cathedral. Um, they get to they get to essentially say, "I told you so." Uh, Red America is a danger. We need to suppress them. We need to suppress Trump supporters. We need to fire everyone. We need to essentially censor Fox News in the name of democracy and freedom. And you know that's the surest way to get them into a position where they can. Obviously, the cathedral can't indefinitely rule because it's it's essentially taken on so much entropy due to due to its divergent interests and its own failures in narrative. But if you want to give them a new lease on life from their decade, that would be that would be a great way temporarily to declare a martial law. I mean, prove CNN right and see if that hurts the cathedral. Um, but thank you for the question. Society Man for $5. What will happen when the boomers are finally retired and no longer the donors everyone is courting? Well, damn, that is a good question. That is sort of, that is the question. My theory is that is going to be the instigating element for the cathedral hitting the wall. You know, I have been tempted to write out sort of a plan of how reactionaries could actually win the culture war. And it always feels LARPy because you're you're essentially, you want to write a story about how this could happen. And, and of course, the future is uncertain, right? You don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know how these things are going to play out. But, but because I want to you know, give people an idea that this is possible, I, I toyed with the fact of, of doing this video. And, and so this goes in phases. Like the first phase is institution building. The second phase is weathering the tack of the cathedral when it comes to these institutions. And the third phase is the cathedral hits the wall and dies. Like its narrative is obviously shown to be false. And moreover, everyone knows that it can't pay back any of its debts, right? Everything people were promised by the cathedral, it's never going to happen. African Americans were promised more social programs. Those more, those social programs are never going to happen. Uh, you know, um, people were promised racial harmony. That's never going to happen. <laughs> um, anarchists and communists were promised an accelerating ramp towards socialism. That's never going to happen. Once the cathedral makes those admissions to elements of its own constituency across the board, uh, then the consensus will fall apart. And I think that admission will come when the boomers start retiring. That being said, I mean, this is what I think this is, you know, Mike Enoch said this, and this might be the one thing I've ever agreed with Mike Enoch on anything. And he said, the greatest joke the boomers will play on their children is, ever is dying. And I think He's 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 right about that. That will be the culminate. That will be the culminating event of our lifetime. The problem, though, society man, is that this process of boomers retiring or leaving the scene, um, this is not a jolt, right? So, in the history books, there will be some disaster that culminates the unraveling of our institutional reality at the highest levels. That jolt cannot be the boomers retiring because that happens linearly. But there will be a tipping point, right? Just because something is lin linear does not mean it experiences a tipping point. And it's anyone's guess what the straw will be uh, that breaks the, camp the camel's back. But, but in many ways, the accelerating decline post-2012 could in many ways be seen as the early boomers uh, and I guess the later silent generation retiring from institution of power and, and, and younger boomers and, and Gen Xers and millennials replacing them. And of course, all of the ideological baggage that comes along with that. Um, so again, yeah, that that is. I mean, I I don't know what to say. What happens, but but what happens is that the cathedral dies. I think, you know, I, I don't think that Gen Xers and millennials are going to be able to hold this together and ensure that all of the promises made by the boomers are going to be honored. And once the cathedral just goes like, hey man, you know, we're never going to be able to do this. Um, yeah, they're going to, um, they're going to say something, uh, they're going to be, um, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's how consensus apparatuses collapse. Ooh, next super chat. This is spicy. American working man for $2. When you have nothing to lose, why not riot? Okay. Um, 
first of all, I doubt that anyone in this country, even African Americans, have nothing to lose. Uh, we are not. We live in it, and this is also something I have to say about things collapsing. Collapse sucks. If you think you have nothing to lose, you know, in in a poor community, what would happen, for instance, if your poor community burnt down its infrastructure and the infrastructure was not replaced and not rebuilt? Um, starving people have nothing to lose. The people who are rioting are not starving. So there's that misnomer. There's that misnomer. But let me strengthen the question and ask, when you have very little, why not riot? I guess if you're a materialist, atheist, nihilist who only believes in material rewards and in not collective well-being um, or, or spiritual well-being, then, yeah, you're right. If you're a materialist who nihilistically denies collective well-being or, or higher purpose, then, yeah, that is correct. If you have very little, you might be able to get yourself a plasma screen television from rioting. Yeah. You can, you can make profit off of riots if you have very, very little. Um, however, for most people, for most people who will ultimately matter, you have collective ambitions. You care about your community. You care about the people around you. Um, burning down infrastructure hurts the collective. It hurts the collective interests of the societies. And not just not the macrocosmic societies, your individual working class society, it hurts. And then for those who believe in a higher power, it also degrades you as an individual. It makes you less heroic and less uh, and less strong. And uh, so if degrading yourself and hurting your communities isn't reason enough to do something, I think that we're probably operating on a very, very different moral plane. And, and nor does and this if, to, to preempt you know, a possible repost off of this question. I mean, this is not... The rioting isn't going to help you get justice for Floyd. It's not going to help you actually implement reform of the police department. And if you're, as your name suggests, if you want some kind of revolution, I mean, I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe you'll get your revolution. I tend to think that if you do these sort of low scale riots, like if you're if you're having these riots and you're not literally displacing the police and taking over their precincts and and, 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 and and creating new government, if you're not literally doing that, your revolution's not getting anywhere. It's it's never going to get anywhere. The only thing you're going to do is destroy the property of the middle class and lower middle class or destroy the police's ability to operate and impose order. And this is so funny. You know, this is I'm going to go on an aside here. Um, speaking of, of revolutionaries who, who've, they, they sound like kids, they, they sound like me in the nineties, like in the late nineties, 1999, when I first brought like a Rage Against the Machine album, or I guess, I think this was actually 2001. Yeah, it was 2001. I, I was, a, I was a latecomer to Rage Against the Machine and like Bush was president. And I thought it was like really edgy by wanting revolution. Uh, and it was some kind of like really, really cringy i think like anarcho libertarian or, or or libertarian socialist revolution that i had because i was i was trying to synthesize like radical leftist ideas with, with libertarianism that was my idea i thought that was my new idea when i was uh when i was you know in, in high school um but 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 people apparently people like Vouch and and and, and modern revolutionaries still hold this idea um and then they go around talking about how they want to abolish all of the police, not like in some hypothetical endpoint of revolution, but right now. Um, and then most prominently, Existential Comics, who does these kind of poorly drawn, and he does these, and I'm going to talk about this maybe if I have time on this live stream. He does these sort of poorly drawn renditions of philosophers uh, talking about ideas like Foucault and like Kierkegaard and, and, and Kant and people like that and Hegel. And, and the comics always sort of embody sort of a, a freshman seminar view of these thinkers. They're not very deep. But just so, just so you can be certain that he's never really thought very deeply about any political ideas beyond sort of serial box stereotypes of certain deep thinkers of the early 20th century, he has like the most weapon grades bad takes of all time that he posts on his Twitter feed. So um, 
existential comics posts, we should just abolish the police permanently right now. This needs to be a, this needs to be a mainstream leftist position, abolish the police. And looking at this and going like, that's the stupidest idea ever. But what's so essentially stupid about it is like, I mean, just do it, motherfucker. I mean, just do it. <laughs> abolish the police. I mean, put me in power. I mean, like, it, it, I won't get put into power because I'm a pacifist. But if you abolish the police, you will destroy this government and the people for which the police is abolished. If Antifa becomes the police, I guarantee it, give it eight months. If Antif With Antifa as the police of this country, you will see a groundswell uprising in this country of the lower middle class and middle class demanding that we have immediate right-wing authoritarian government <laughs> to bring sanity back to this country. Maybe with some kind of nominal democracy as a nod to the original constitution. Police ab Universal police abolition replaced with ideological activists is the surest way to get right-wingers into power. Uh, but if you're a right-winger, you cannot desire that, or at least if you're a Christian. Christians cannot desire a, a, a bad, um, something bad in order to bring about something good, uh, which is a little bit too deep for now. Um, Lance Gubble for $5. Do you have any recommended reading for someone wanting to understand the origins of the cathedral? Um, Molebug's open letter to an open-minded progressive strikes me as um, as a good starting point for that. Um, if you want something that's audio, an audio format, um, uh, there is a YouTube channel. I, I'm going to mispronounce his name. And... Anim, anam, anamnesis, I think, is his name. I, I, I he had to do the guest video, but, but he sort of does. Um, his channel is dedicated to sort of the Mencius Molebug B sides, like you know, I did an overview of Molebug. Charlemagne did an awesome overview of Molebug, uh, and uh, but but anima, anima thesis, he does sort of the the B-side deep cut, like indie band takes of Molebug. So if you want to get into the weeds of how this app thing works, he would be an excellent channel to start um, start on. And um, so I'll just throw that recommendation out here. I might have to kind of up the speed at which I read these super chats here. Um, but, but yeah, I hope that recommendation works. Ted Bell for $5. There have been small but violent protests even here in small town North Carolina. I think I have an idea what town that is, but I'm not going to say. I wonder if the cathedral has overstepped. Normie, Normie Con relatives are pissed. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Normie Con relatives can be... The problem is, like, Normie Con's really... <laughs> the problem is, like, the cathedral knows it has Normie Con's licked, right? So Normie Con's... Pissed Normie Con's that become reactionaries and understand that the problem goes to the heart of the media and the academy and our institutions, that's useful. But normie cons that are pissed and then sit around their grill going, mo law and order, mo mo inner city blacks, like that's useless. Like, A, normie cons don't have the demographic sway to get anyone into power that could fix anything. Their last hurrah, which appears to be Trump, is manifestly not fixing the underlying institutional problems that have to do with modern solutions coming about. And uh, in, in the meantime, uh, they're just saying the same things over and over again. So hopefully the Normicon relatives can come around to a better understanding and they can start talking in ways that doesn't simply play into the narrative boxes progressives already have assigned for them. Normicons can do something by saying this. I deeply sympathize with George Floyd's death. I deeply sympathize with the black community. The media has failed you. The government has failed you. I think we need to do. I think we need to look into more radical solutions, and those radical solutions are not coming from the left. That's what need to be. That's what normie cons need to start saying. I mean, and how could the solutions be coming from the left? They're literally participating in the burning of these cities. Oh no, I'm sorry, I forgot. That was uh, that was white supremacists, right? That was Count Dan that was Count Dankula's pug dog who's burning the cities. Yeah. He's, uh, it's, it's the white supremacy that's gone too far. 
Um, okay, uh, hopefully that answers your question, Ted Bell. I apologize for going a little bit faster, but uh, I'm trying to get to the end of these things. Um, whoa, there's a lot. Um, okay, Eric Johnson for $50 South Korean. You need to look at a class perspective. Why are upper middle class white liberal progressives the way they are? It's in their interest to do so. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Class perspective is a useful way to look at this problem. Um, okay, before we get too far, though, on the Marxist stuff, the problem is, is that the Marxist view of class is idiotic. It postulates two classes, a proletariat and a bourgeoisie, and somehow the bourgeoisie encompasses like rednecks who work blue collar jobs, the lower middle class, and like factory owners with non-woke opinions. And then the proletariat is like all of the good people who are progressive in their voting patterns. Plus for some reason, like tech people and, and, uh, and, and academics that have left left leaning sensibilities. Uh, that's a stupid class analysis. Um, yeah, I totally agree. Class analysis needs to be one component of the analysis. Certainly economic class isn't everything. Um, but it is certainly the case that liberals, progressives get a benefit. But here's the thing. I mean, the benefit they get cannot be understood in economic terms. Why are progressives giving money to bail out rioters in, in cities that they hope to occupy at some point? I don't think you can explain that in material interest. You can only explain it in terms of religious interest. The reason why they're giving money to bail out protesters is because their religion, and I did a series of tweets on this today, their religion is 100% organized around themselves specifically, always being on the side of caring and compassion, on the side of implicit, on the side of implicit pacifist Christian ethics. You know, the sort of, Leo Tolstoy Christianity minus any notion of spirituality or God. Basically, they're trying to materialize piety. So all, you are absolutely right, the the middle class white progressive that is is cheering while the, inner, while the city's burned down, the, the class is a necessary component. Their, their perspective couldn't be explained unless we understood that they were comfortable and that they benefited from consensus reality going forward. But we can't understand their specific actions unless we look at it through a religious perspective, through understanding that progressivism is a religion of, of sorts, of sorts, in, in the broadest possible sense. And that their specific actions are, are only crazy if you do not understand them as essentially trying to materialize piety trying to come up with a material way of exhibiting and participating piously in what they see as a religious struggle. So hopefully, I, I think I've addressed that question. Dave the Librarian for $10. Aside from the obligatory self-improvement and community building, how can us outcasts on the dissident right use these rights to discredit the cathedral? Um... Um, I think, I mean, you know, self-improvement and community building are vague. Obviously, the cathedral offer us an opportunity for a discussion. Okay, like, here's an exercise people can do. Uh, maybe this is too woo-woo for people. But, like, when something like this happens, right, just sit back and just try to clear out of your mind every descriptor of what you have going on politically and just look at the events as they have actually occurred on the ground and then try to come out with the most sincere religious reflection on what's happened. You know, maybe say a prayer, uh, and, um, and, and, and meditate on how you can make things better. And I think what will come out of this is this, okay, what's happened? A man's dead unjustly, unjustly dead. He's been, possibly probably murdered that's sad i can sympathize with that a city is burning multiple cities are burning people are being murdered for almost no reason i can sympathize with that and then try to come out with your most sincere 
non-ideological perspective and then just express that to people. That's going to reach people in light of these confusing times more than any kind of like, you know, and of course, in, in, in on Twitter, we're sort of designed to come out with these snarky takes that, that are really quick and then they reference the right people who are really cool, like Nick Land. He's cool. I mean, is Nick Land cool? I don't know if he's cool anymore. But like Spandrel and all these people who are in the inn who know how, what's going on and, and, it's, and it's really fun and you feel smart. Inside these riots, uh, people are confused and they're scared and uh, they just want you to level with them. You're going to advance the cause and and bring people forward. And there's really no way to go forward without more people than we have right now. But you're going to reach more people and go forward if you just pause the ideology, assess what's happened, and then explain to them what you're seeing, how you're feeling, and then afterwards explain how your ideology has constructed on top of all of these things that have happened, possible solutions, possible ways to interact with this that don't feel so dirty. Because I think the people who know that they're egging on these rights, I think they know they know they're doing something dirty. Like I think even, even though they explain this on this that they, they explain this themselves like, oh, these are protests. I'm only supporting the people who are nonviolent. The people who are um, burning things down, they're all like count, they're all named Count Dankula and and they're white supremacists. Like they know that that last one's a lie. They know that um, you, there's no way you can target money only at the peaceful protests. They know that even the peaceful protests aren't going to do anything. Uh, they know that this is a lie. And I think the sincere interaction in light of these riots is the one that you want to actually pursue. Um, thank you very much. I just have to go fast. I'm sorry, guys. The Fascist Anarchist for $50 South Korean. Good morning from... Or is this Swedish? I'm sorry. Is S-E-K... I keep on thinking that's South Korean. Is that is that is that Swedish currency? I, I apologize. Is that Swedish krunar? Oh, whatever. Um, good morning from Sweden, Dave. Vouch is pretty cringe, to be honest. Here's some cash. Um, this is, you know, and of course, I was planning to stream at this time uh, for a while. I guess I only posted the link uh, this morning. And then, and then I had that big failure. But I was, I was planning to stream for a while. And I was going to stream on the subject of Vouch and and and, and the prospects of, of this playing out. Um, the Vouch. I mean, there's just there's just no way to debate this person. The way to debate him. I mean, if we were going to do this and we were going to like try to out Vouch 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 Vouch, I'm told that I mispronounce his name. I'm I'm sorry if I do. Um, what would you do? You play a good frame game. You'd try to snark. You'd undercut him, and of course. Um, you do a lot of dishonest stuff. Um, you, you you play sourcing games, which of course he does. Uh, and of course, at the end of it all, all of his little buddies would say, oh, you were destroyed. Or or maybe you could also beat him by doing what Count Dankula does and, and just sort of cooling it down, you know, be the cucumber in the room. Just sit back and, and puff on a cigarette and kind of eh, scoff at it. And then that second one, you'll probably get a lot, you'll get across a many fewer points, but at the same time, Vouch will kind of look optically worse. Um, neither of these things is going to actually address the problem that Vouch represents for the community. The problem that Vouch represents for the right-wing community is that he is, he is, a barrier in the way of genuine conversations that exist sincerely with leftists that might actually be interested in our ideas. Uh, Bausch, the reason people like him is that he does not understand anything. He only understands debates as a way to get victory and to score points. Uh, I doubt he understands any of the ideas I talk about on my channel. I doubt he's, he's actually engaged with the very few ideas I was able to get across to him in the 20 minutes I spoke to him, or was it like 40? I forget. It felt a lot longer. Um, but but he can yell at me and he can make me look stupid and he can and he can hold insults over my head. And this is what I also realized, you know, I, I realized um I was doing this in, in my discussion with him is that he holds he holds insults over your head. Um uh, 
so you start panicking and then you start making mistakes, both in frame game and also in fact. And then he can use those mistakes to sort of dance around and, and play play like he's superior. The only thing that's eventually going to defeat Vouch is just a sincere engagement with the other side. I'm not so sure exactly what that looks like. I think maybe it could be pursued by people with, from, with channels like Faraday Speaks. You know, I've had a lot of disagreements with Faraday. Um, and, and then, you know, in, in, in some ways, Faraday and Shoe on Head and, and people like that are the reason why Vouch is in this advantageous position. It's because he has centrist people who are willing to hold him up as a good faith actor when it's obvious from every one of his interactions that this person is just not interested in actually understanding ideas and that he had, and, he, and he's guilty of everything he, he accuses his opponents of being and doing. Um, but, but even so, I, I think that engaging sincerely with parties that are, are at least open to the left is once people see internet blood sports aren't gen or, or Vouch, once people see that Vouch is not generating anything that lasts, they'll move away from him eventually. You know, I have this, I, I was thinking of kind of writing an open letter to Colin, uh, the guy behind uh, Faraday Speaks. He uses that name, so I'm not doxing him or anything. Um, I was thinking of, of writing an open letter to him, just just talking to him about being a centrist and trying to decide between two sides that look like they both have bad actors. And I'm not going to lie, we have bad actors on the right, right? So if you're if you're more of a normie disposition and you're trying to figure out who are the good guys, um, you know, I have to admit, you know, if you go far enough to my right, you get to cringe neo-Nazi people who probably are sociopaths. I, you know, that's true. Um, and that's a big barrier for people like Faraday, and maybe maybe it should be. But um, I, I would say this, and this is my prediction with Vouch. Uh, you know, I probably might lose a frame game to him. Some people say I did lose a frame game to him. Um, I don't think he's ever addressed any of my arguments or ideas. And I'll say this, there's going to be a consequence to this. The consequence is that Vouch is going to slowly lose He's going to slowly disconnect from the narrative of interesting ideas that are being talked about. He's going to lack the language to talk about interesting ideas because he's going to be constantly going after low-hanging fruit and drama. Furthermore, when he tries to actually develop his own positive vision of the world, it's going to be easy prey for people who have shit their shit together, right? People have already dissected his little, you know, oppo research document, which is incredibly poorly sourced. And they've already taken it apart. Uh, so his whole ma evidence thing kind of looks weak in hindsight. And and I think more consistently when, when that starts happening, uh, what he's going to do, what Vouch is going to do, is he's going to start changing his positions, right? When it comes to the four, that <clears throat> this whole libertarian, when it comes to the for, the forefront, I should say, that his notion of libertarian anarchism this actually isn't so well supported by the data. He's going to try to modify his positions and play fast and loose. But in that, he's going to have to do, he's going to have to play fast and loose with his own values. And my wager is this to the left, is that the left is mercurial. The right changes, <clears throat> the right changes its ideas and its political modes, but we do not change what we value, we do not change our priorities in life and what we're working towards and what we're loyal to. And I think that you'll see this a lot on the left. It, not now necessarily, but if you look at the career of Vouch from the perspective of 10 years from when he first started, I think you'll see someone who cynically changes his values to get what he wants and to always stay in the limelight. And to always be the person who has the right answers and the person who's owning people. Or you'll see a person who essentially had to jump down one rabbit hole or the other and then became a fixture who wasn't up to date with his own radical ideology because he had no mind for it. Anyway, I hope that answers the question, um, or even if it was a question. So next one's Eric Johnson uh, for $50 SEK. One third, I would love, I would like to comment 
I would like to comment is that we live in a decadent society and more so in a technical sense than any moral one. What I mean by that is, I guess I'll just read this for another 50. Um, People can see the main problem in society. They know that the problem must be solved. They know how to solve the problem and that yet they do nothing. That is a dangerous, that is dangerous in a society that our society won't last. Absolutely 100% Eric Johansson. Uh, That is absolutely correct. Um, This, and this is, and this is where I would start for more intelligent people. The thing that demonstrates that our society really needs a radical change and not in the left-wing direction is the demonstration that our apparatus for correct fact generation is systematically mendacious. It means that it systematically tells lies. There are certain truths about political reality in this country that our modern day media and academy just can't talk about. And so we constantly go over the same problems. We constantly go over the same issues and no one has any solutions to them. We, we know that these problems exist. We never fix them. And this is an indication of a much, much deeper problem and a problem that must, I think, necessarily start at, uh, at a deeper level inside our institutional reality, inside the consensus making part of, of our society which is the academy. And it's a problem that obviously generates from the left and not from the right. The right have old and out-of-date ideas, but those old and out-of-date ideas don't really influence contemporary policymakers in a very real way. And because of that, um, they're obviously not the cause of this problem. Uh, The right should integrate theory of collapse in the same way we integrated Moldbuck, but in an intelligent way as a process. Without this, rightist people will be stuck polishing brass on the Titanic. Okay, yes, but this is the problem. So the collapse, the collapse has two main problems with it. And so we're talking about the fact that, and this sort of builds on what Eric Johansson said about how what what the real red pill is understanding you're in a society that cannot self-correct itself. It's not that the Titanic is headed toward an iceberg. It's that the Titanic is headed towards an iceberg and the rudder isn't isn't working. The rudder not working is what Eric Johansson was talking about. And and that's and that's it's it's the fact that it can't correct its mistakes. And it should be able to. The problem with the collapse narrative is that it's not short of a very, very firm grip on the wheel. It's not a very easy thing to get people to react to in a good way. So, for instance, uh, the immediate result of a collapse narrative is the black pill. Sit back. We're all doomed. We're all doomed. Oh, let's just, you know, play video games and scoff at how stupid people are. I mean, that doesn't do it for me. It doesn't do it for people who have families. It doesn't do it for people whose priorities exist in a way that it extends beyond the next decade, um, that that can't be the solution, and it's not. And, and obviously, it's not even a solution to people's happiness because it makes people miserable living like this. So the black pill is the first wrong answer. The second wrong answer, or there's sort of one and a half other wrong answers. Um, the second wrong answer is accelerationism and civil war. Um, this doesn't work. Uh, a, it's unethical for Christians to do, but even if you're a propertarian, um, anyway, as I've stated, unless you've got some secret battle plan, uh, that I'm not aware of and wouldn't be, uh, these kind of attacks are guarded against by the cathedral. They know they're coming and they almost certainly will not work. And moreover, anyone who cooperates with you is painting a big target on their back so they can just be taken out by the apparatus of the state and they will be taken out justly because that's illegal and then the the sort of the 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 sort of bad but not necessarily completely bad strategy is entryism which works to a limited degree but doesn't seem to be fast enough and i I think finally the 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 right way to handle it is parallelism is, is building institutions that are separate insulated and very, very difficult to attack. But the problem with the force solution 
is that it's very, very difficult to do. It's not entertaining or cathartic to build something small that is robust. It's much easier to make flashy, ostentatious attacks at your opponents. And because of that, it just never seems to sell very properly. Um, so maybe I'll do a video on this in the future. So um, uh, I, I guess I'll just move on. Um, and, and Eric Johansson, I guess I this is the last one. It's dangerous and it won't last. Uh, I already read this. Um, Duke it for $5. <laughs> So what comes, an alien invasion, mass enlightenment, or a nuclear war? Well, uh, certainly if uh, 2020 were a, a movie, I'd expect one of those things to happen. Uh, certainly we're just getting sort of uh, the creeping suspicion that things are getting worse and that we're entering into disaster areas. Um, and I'm not so sure what to do. Uh, but... Uh, I guess I wouldn't be surprised in any of them, although I don't really, I don't really believe in, I don't really believe in aliens, to be quite honest. Um, going on to Kay Lewis for two dollars, why stay in California from an NRX perspective? Okay, well, I mean, this is a good question. First of all, I guess uh, the reason why I stay in California is largely having to do with family reasons and and job reasons. Um. It's a very hard state to be a middle-class person in. The cost of living is insanely high. But let's just take the problem generally. Why do we not want to wholesale retreat to red areas? Um, so part of the reason, part, part of the way parallelism has to succeed. Parallelism cannot be let's run for the hills. I think this is an important addendum to things like the Benedict Option. You run for the hills, you take up residence in places like Montana and, you know, and Wyoming and in sparsely populated states away from the centers of power. The cathedral will pursue. <clears throat> That's absolutely the case. And you'll basically have to hide from it, which means that you're not going to be very much of a player in the political games that you need to protect your own community. I don't think that this in isolation, although I do totally support people going to dent, uh, you know sparsely populated states and, and creating intentional communities, that cannot be the only thing people do. There needs to be a presence of reactionary communities who are allied to those more far-flung projects who exist right next to, right next to the cathedral's decision-making apparatuses. There needs to be people who live in major metropolitan areas that have ideas that are reactionary, that are able to communicate these ideas to other people who are interested. We need to build a counter-narrative apparatus that exists in these places. And that's going to require people who live in areas like New York and California and Paris and London. Um, you know, that's 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 the reality to it. I and I and for this reason, I don't think, you know, just calling the retreat option is a very good way to approach this. We need to be amphibians. We need to be able to operate in both contexts. And, and I, I don't see how um, uh, there's any other way around it. Uh, am I anywhere near the bottom of this? Uh, thank you very much. Die Hard Doogie for $5. I can't get over the response of the Korean community to the LA riots again. Rooftop Koreans are an inspiration. Well, I, yeah, again, this is the reactionary language that the world understands, right? Defending your home and property from invaders is not stodgy. I mean, this is the whole thing. I mean, sitting on a couch with a grill complaining about ma law and order and, and ma uh, uh, black community, that's cringe because it's obviously done from a place of privilege. Holding a rifle on the roof of the shop that your parents built is never cringe. It's never cringe because it's a core embodiment of the virtue that you preach. The only reason the the boomer cons are, are so cringe is because they're they're isolated and removed from actually practicing what they preach in their virtue sense. If they practice what they preached in their virtue sense, uh, they would no longer be cringe. That's why you know the, these photographs from the Rodney King riots of 
of Koreans. And they, they kind of look, I mean, I'm not going to lie. They, they, if you encounter these people on the subway, you would say they would, they would look derpy. But in that moment, they've embraced the heroism of the virtue of defending your homestead from an invader. And, 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 and that's why, you know, 20, 20 years later, 25 years later, they still are, are really awesome and they really look based. Uh, EA Kesson, 12 for five, $50, SEK. Thank you very much. There's no question. Mr. Blank for $5. Betting on the fall of the cathedral as a pronomian event is a pipe dream. It will have to be replaced with something. I'm betting Cthulhu decides. Well, okay. I mean, the fall of the cathedral is itself an antinomian event. But what it does is it, is it allows it allows for it allows for the necessity uh, of a reset. It allows for I mean institutions degrade entropically, but new institutions always begin at a low entropy state, right? Because new institutions are always necessarily formed on high bonds of trust. So so if we were to actually build something. Uh, you know, I don't know, us, the people in this, in this, in this chat, if we were to build something, let's say we all knew each other, we all lived on the same block, which is, I guess that itself is a pipe dream, but, but, you know, humor me, humor me in my, in my 30 year old boomer tendencies. If we were to all build something together that was radical and that was right wing and that was uh, outside of the cathedral, we would need to build bonds of trust and we would need to build close bonds of cohesion. Uh, that would be the pronomian event. The ascension of that community into a position of, of power and authority, uh, that would be what would be allowed for by the cathedral's collapse. Uh, the development of the community would necessarily have to be small. Uh, it would necessarily have to be distributed in a lot of ways, and it would necessarily have to be led by people who really had their shit together. Pardon my French. And, and, and so I think we're, we're kind of confusing um, the event. We're, we're confusing the removal of a roadblock for the construction of the vehicle that can drive you through, the, uh, drive you across the road once the roadblock is removed. And us as reactionaries is, is, is I mean, it, it, we're, we're against the cathedral and we're for the embarrassment of the cathedral, really so that the cathedral lacks the power to attack us outright. Uh, our, our main job, our main task, is one of construction and building. Diehard Doogie, again for $10, says, The workers in the Russian Revolution were told that they had nothing to lose. It turns out that they could lose their lives. Where life exists, there are possibilities. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, just a clarification. I would say that, you know, the, the workers, the proletariat of, of Moscow, probably, probably they were safe, at least until at least until the wars came. Um, at least until the wars came. And, uh, but, 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 but I'll, I'll say this, and this is what I always tell, uh, revel, I tell this to, to communists. I say this, you know, if you were, if you were, tra you spend most of your time complaining why lower middle class rural Americans aren't communists. If I were to transport you back to 1912 in Tsarist Russia, you'd spend most of your time complaining why rich lower middle class peasants aren't communists. Yet in 1912, every lower middle class peasant was right not to be a communist because when the communists got into power, they murdered them. And this always happens. The person that suffers, the bourgeoisie that really gets the shit kicked out of it, it's not the, it's not the bourgeoisie of the aristocracy and the owners. It's the petite bourgeoisie of the small shop owner. It's the petite bourgeoisie of the lower middle class of the small farmer. They can't move. <clears throat> They're the ones that get subjected to the less revolutionary vengeance. And so, I mean, and, and I don't know, I mean, th this is why, I mean, this is why looking at communists like Trotsky, just, it, it has to fill one with the, okay, it looks like we reconnected. I, I guess what I'm saying here is I can't, I can't put it together in my mind how 
communists, <clears throat> how modern communists don't see themselves as possibly participating in this. I, I assume that we're back online now. Okay, I see it projecting. So, <clears throat> okay, yeah, it's back. And there's always a little bit of lag here, so it notifies me that it's failed, but it's um, it's 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 not going to. I can't do anything about the lag. Okay, so I mean, I guess this is just what infuriates me about communists generally. I'm gonna see if I can't get to the end of the super chats. Um, at hopefully, guys, I I mean, I appreciate the enthusiasm, but um, I'm going to need to probably start winding this down around twelve twenty. So um. Maybe we can wrap the Super Chats by then. Uh, I think I'm coming towards the end. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. The Walrus... The Walrusophist. I love that name. The, the Walrusophist. The Walrusophist. The Walrusophist. Uh, my wife would love that name. She loves animal names that are combined with philosophy terms. I think the original idea for her channel was called Philosophus Loss. That was the original channel name. <laughs> um, I've learned a great deal from your material for $5. Thank you. Here, have some filthy lucre. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, Nicodemus Smith for New Zealand, $2. How did, King Dan How did Count Dankula's pug burn down America? Well, I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? Uh, Count Dankla's uh, pug was con convicted of uh, white supremacy. And as our as our media establishment has been so generous to point out, uh, it is it is very likely white supremacists that are responsible for our city's burning. They're the outside agitators that have come in and have committed all the violence in the names of the otherwise peaceful left-wing protests. <laughs> Uh, it was originally sort of a takeoff on the fact that Count Dankula, in addition to his 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 sort of official trial at the hands of the British state for teaching his pug to Sig Heil, was sort of again put on a, a mock trial for being a white supremacist by uh, the wonderful YouTuber called Vouch. And that, my most recent video was concerning that dishonest tactic. Um and this is sort of how a white supremacist can, and this is sort of where I was going with this is a white supremacist in its, you know, if we're saying you, know, you are a white supremacist in its mod definition, it is a, everyone's white supremacist. All Karens are white supremacist. Anyone who has white privilege is participating in a system of white supremacy. So, so rightfully, we could say that all of these white Antifa protesters that are burning shit down, I mean, maybe they are. I mean, under the magic word, they are certainly white supremacists in some sense. Um, and so you can, you can, and, and I'm sure that when the cathedral, if they ever get called on this, which maybe they never will, that they probably will say some variation of this. They'll say that the white people who agitated for the violence the Antifa members, they were participating in a mode of white privilege, and therefore we were right about saying that white supremacists were advocating for this. Uh, that will be the excuse. Uh, that will be their fallback position if they need to throw Antifa under the bus. Um, and you know, I, I just think I think it's sad. I think it's sad that that people aren't seeing through this. And, and you know, obviously, you know, you're not going to convince anyone. Uh, to have a more honest dialogue by teaching them the fallacies or even bu even by showing them my videos. My videos are just sort of intellectual toys, to be quite honest. Uh, I hope they are educational to a certain degree. Um, but, but you're not going to teach anyone this. Uh, you're not going to teach anyone. Uh, people don't avoid dishonest situations because they, they know the right fallacies or, or the right word to call these things. Um they, they learn it because they have a value for honesty. This is what I pointed out in my last video on the Vouch uh, Count Dankula debate on Faraday Speaks channel. Um, of course, they they probably don't know anything about like Mott and Bailey, which is which is a well known um, a well known sort of fallacy 
I don't know if it's a formal fallacy. It's certainly an informal one. They don't. They certainly don't know my like magical word terminology, which I borrowed from Chairman Mao. Um, and explaining that to them wouldn't actually correct the mistakes of, of that very, very dishonest accusation. But everyone in that that circumstances, uh, everyone in, in that, everyone on Vaush's side, everyone on Faraday's speak side, they all knew that calling Count Ankula a white supremacist publicly was a massively dishonest act. They know how the game works. You change the definition to make it so it applies to everyone and then you call them an incredibly socially damaging thing in public, so they have to react to it in some big way. It's juvenile, and it's incredibly dishonest. I don't actually think that that Faraday Speaks and Bausch's live stream audience did not know that that was a juvenile and dishonest thing to put in front of Count Dankula. I just think that they lack the values to feel embarrassed and shameful about doing something juvenile dishonest. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's a values question. And I know Faraday is a good guy. And maybe Faraday you know, might have had some misconceptions about what he was doing. Because I think, I mean, his personality gets swept up in things a lot, right? He, you know, this is how a lot of people are who are younger than me. They get swept up in trends, right? And Vouch is a trend right now. And accusing people of being racist is a trend right now. And I'm sure if he thought about this a little bit more, he'd think better of it. But a lot of people, you know, they see what Vouch is doing. They know it's dishonest. They know it's juvenile. But it's fun. I mean, it's fun to punish people. It's fun to punish people in a mob. And, and, and without the value that teaches you that this is dirty to do... Uh, you keep you keep on, especially if you have a moral excuse to make yourself look good. You keep on doing it. Um, so that is what it is. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you can see the circles under my eyes. Uh, this is uh, these are the um, the 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 new father circles here, uh, and you know. <laughs> I, I don't want to stay up too late doing this because uh, my wife needs to get some relief and and uh, the the false start really has cut into that. But thank you everyone for uh, for viewing. Hopefully I've I've shed some enlightenment on these situations. I'd like to do more live streams. I love to do them. Maybe if I you know maybe we'll I'll do live streams on my wife's channel uh, that are just like throwaway live streams where I can just talk extemporaneously. You know, we've been talking about doing this together as a family. And, you know, just me and her, obviously, obviously, obviously um, not not children. I, I don't think children have a place on the Internet without, you know, b before they are of age to, to know what that means. Um, but I was thinking of doing uh, live streams with us and uh, and to just having it being very low quality. Usually my rule for these, again, is, is oh, I never release a live stream uh, without having a, a video an edited video that i did before that of of some substance right and and so there you go um okay uh spaghetto for five dollars again thank you very much when someone says that riots are the answer you can hear the attempt to convince themselves under the smugness people getting off on being realists Okay, I'm having a hard time understanding this because this this seems like it's almost certainly uh, a miswritten, right? Because don't people say riots are not the answer? I guess I'll answer this in two ways. Let, let's assume both. Okay, so people who say that the riots are justified. Um, yes, they're definitely smug. This is your classic progressive virtue signaling. Um and you can definitely hear the smugness. I mean, they do not care that this problem is solved. The cities that these riots go on in are, I mean, they were progressive in the 90s and they are super progressive now. And they're only getting more progressive. And they have manifestly failed to solve these problems at the microcosmic level. That being said, and this sort of feeds into the other one, the reason why they oftentimes defend riots is that they're genuinely hoping to get boomer answers from their right-wing family members. 
they're hoping to get the whole boomer oh, law and order blah, 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 blah. you know can't people just keep their heads down and pull themselves up by their bootstraps uh, blah, 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 blah. like they're trying to get those answers so that they can repost off of them and feel more smug uh, i think the solution to these things is to not give the virtue signaling progressive uh these types of standard normie con answers uh they they don't help your case uh, i i think they they communicate a certain amount of obliviousness and and they also discount i mean to a certain degree, you know, these um, these progressive reactions to to these unlawful killings or these murders are are affected, but but there is some genuineness to them. You can watch the video of this man being murdered by police, and it's enraging. It genuinely is enraging, um, and, uh, and 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 if you discount that, if you downplay it in conversation with them. Uh, They'll feel that callousness more than they'll feel your genuine frustration at at the dishonesty implicit in in the signaling mechanism, and they'll try to resolve the conversation in a way that that's comfortable for them. And, and if this is meant, if this is meant in the opposite way, uh, if this is meant to be a comment on on normie cons, uh, people who say that riots are not the answer. Uh, yeah, that, that kind of comes off as smug as well. I, I, I mean, okay, I mean, this is the thing. The only time I say riots are not the answer or riots don't work is when I'm, I'm literally face-to-face -face with progressives telling me that riots are somehow some kind of heroic response to the reality of, of, of blacks being murdered by police. I agree that the, the riots are not the answer line is smug, it's condescending, it comes off as being detached. But it's also, in a policy sense, strictly speaking, true. And when the conversation is ridiculous in, in the dimension of, of, of our opponents, I'm not so sure how... I'm not saying we can't mix it up and make it sound different and make it sound more authentic, but... At some level, we're going to have to overcome the hurdle with the laugh that, like, burning down a target does not actually institute police reform. <clears throat> that has to be observed in the conversation. Or, or, or maybe, I mean, maybe that's the wrong place to start. I think there's a good case that that's the wrong place to start. Um... The Wooster for $10. One of my center-left friends literally said that no person... Blaming Antifa, well, hold on, and no person blaming Antifa has shown a single shred of evidence of them. How can you convince these people that they stuck that they are stuck in a partisan mindset? Um, I I just wouldn't start here. I just wouldn't start here. I mean, if if someone is saying that they can't see Antifa, when people wearing Antifa. Okay, looks like we're back. Yeah, I know. I can't. I can't make my ISP better. <laughs> no amount of tech skill is going to make my ISP better. Um, but I think we're back. So, um, so this is. Um, <laughs> this is. Um, okay, let me get the super chats back on. But but this is uh, something that I wanted to talk about. Um, if you're talking to somebody who's like hard, hard, hard left, hard, hard left, right? Um, do just, just walk them through this. Just walk them through this, right? These riots aren't going to fix the solution of police brutality. What is your solution? And if their solution is, their, their solution is one or three things. Like stay the course with the democratic line. Put radical socialists in charge of municipalities or abolish the police. And in every one of their solutions, just ask yourself, if they say, in every one, to say, I don't believe that will work. I don't believe staying the democratic line in these cities will work because it hasn't. That's the easiest one. That's the easiest way to explain that you don't believe it works because it literally hasn't. I don't believe that putting socialists in charge of these cities will work either 
I mean, for, for more or less, because their, their solutions to these problems don't materially look that different from the Democratic Party. And to the extent that they do differ, they're never going to happen. They, they look like abolish the police. And I, and I don't believe in abolish the police because it's an idiotic idea. For so many reasons, it's kind of stupid to even go into them. So, um... <laughs> So, um, so th that's how I would start. That's how I would start the conversation. I think that just start with incredulity. Like, how would what would you tell to a person who does not believe your solutions will work? How can we move forward here? Because I believe that the only way that I can actually address this is to politically separate myself. So my options aren't deal with constant riots and murders or deal with the complete control of people, of radicals who I don't trust to actually administrate over me. That's 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 what, how I would deal with this problem. That's what I think the only solution is. Okay. Um, okay. Something decent for DKT $20 says, Dave, so cute, UWU. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife just laughed at that. Okay, so I even in these horrible lights, I I I think I look like a, 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 a droopy eye. I think I look like that dog who has the droopy eyes from the Hanna Barbera cartoons. I don't know what he's called, but um, yeah. Well, but thank you, thank you, um, thank you for the super chat. Uh, American working man for two dollars. Um, <laughs> this is the, the classic leftist solution. Um, American working man for $2. Trump should be offered up as a scapegoat. Um, yeah, to who? <laughs> uh, to who? I mean, this is, I mean, I, I'm no fan of Donald Trump, right? I'm no fan of Donald Trump. Um, but but you want me to counter signal Donald Trump for the pleasure of socialists and Democrats, the socialists and anarchists who probably want to murder people like me, and the Democrats who want to rob them? Like, why? <laughs> why would I ever do that? That's like the stupidest thing ever. Um you, the Democrats have no better solutions, so offering and, and who what, who would this satisfy? If I offered Trump up as a scapegoat to you guys, you'd only get more emboldened to ask for my blood. And, and so and so, all, all I'm doing is I mean, this is just sort of like this is concern trolling, right? I mean, working man, you must know. I mean, like I you're probably a communist or a socialist or not. Like, would you do that? To, would, would if, if, if the alt-right or, or some radical right-wing faction, if, if they somehow came out with, with like, even if this was Trump's fault, even, this, even if this was Trump's fault, right? Even if this was, if we could manifestly show that Trump just fucked up and he caused this officer to murder the black man or he didn't send the troops in soon enough. Uh, if, if the shoe was on the other foot and the alt-right have the goods and they showed that, like, they showed that that Bernie Sanders, like, they showed that Bernie Sanders um, participated. He he fucked up and he caused some massive um, problem. Uh, would would you deliver him as a scapegoat to the radical right? Uh, of course you wouldn't. I mean, come on. <laughs> of course you wouldn't. But but thank you for the super chat though. Um, why isn't my thing scrolling down further? Okay, so I think we are coming towards the end of the Super Chats. So let's, no more Super Chats after Catholic Wench's Super Chat, okay? Um, thank you very much, guys. I'll, I'll do a little bit of a denouement, but uh, it's always so weird getting Super Chatted by, I mean, we're, we're essentially just giving Google 30% of $5. <laughs> but 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 it's, I guess, I guess this is, this is the entertainment value. Um. Catholic bunch for five dollars. Morel, what about applying three states? 
Uh, what about applying three states? I think classes to Molebug's thesis, nobility, population, and clergy. I say this as a historian. Well, oddly enough, and I don't know if you've read some of the deeper cuts on Molebug, he does apply a um, a classification to American class. And he 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 classifies our our class system into Brahmins, which are the cathedral, the cathedral elites. So there are the professors, the HR department staffers, basically the rich, educated blue state Americans. The Brahmins, the optimates which are a dying class. Uh, they're, they're basically like the National Review types, the people who used to run America um, officially before 1936 and, and in, in pieces at, uh, between, I would say in pieces between 1946 and 2012, the Optimates ran America. And then you, you have is you have peasants, which are standard red Americans, and you have, um, and you have clients or, or, Slave class, uh, which are which are essentially the blue, uh, the blue state hoi ploi, the 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 the, the lower class non whites, etc. 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 The people who are gaining something from the cathedral materially, and he uses this one to explain how the cathedral works. Now, I take it when you say nobility, population, clergy, we're talking about the cathedral itself. Um, in which case, I guess the clergy and the population would work a little bit like the would work a little bit like the Brahmins and the client or slave class. Um, that there would be a definite correlation there. Um, but I don't know how the clergy would differ from the nobility. I guess the nobility would be like George Soros and the clergy would be like the professorate. Uh, perhaps that would be a division. I guess, you know, there's so few of these funding billionaires and people who are just obviously on the top of things that um, I, I guess it doesn't make sense for for most people like myself to come up with a collective noun that describes them. Uh, but that 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 should be what it is. So I guess we're sort of winding things down here. Um, again, I apologize for the stream flop earlier. Um but I, I guess this taking stock of things, sort of the message of this stream, as far as I can figure it out, I'm, I, I guess we're, we're just moving into times that are, are less stable. And, and it's obvious that the consensus that we're dealing with when we talk to people who are, who are well-educated and defend the status quo of the academy and the media this narrative is just not working for me anymore or for many Americans who are not literally benefiting from it. And it's my sincere opinion that we need to push on this. But it's also my sincere opinion that we need to push on this. That our, our secret sauce, the core tech that the right has that the left doesn't, is it has... I think the left has sincerity. And the left has, it has a certain amount of realism and vivacity. But what it doesn't have is the vivacity and the sincerity in the same place and in the same people. So, for instance, um, one of my least favorite bloggers, I guess, you know, let's compare two vloggers. Um, so, Big Joel. Um, Big Joel is very sincere that's one good thing i'm going to say about him he's a very sincere soul apparently i think he believes everything he says he has the misfortune unfortunately and this is not his fault he has the misfortune of sharing facial characteristics that are not his fault but i associate them with people who are lying to me um, i don't know why um, and, and the way he, he smiles at the camera a little bit too much, I associate that with people who, who are lying to me. But listening to his videos for a very long time, I'm absolutely convinced that he is sincere. You know, I've overcome my my bias and hangups. And I, I can definitely see that he is sincere. Um, the problem is, is he's just totally detached from reality. And his principles and his ethics and his morals are just all wrong and they're they're all just the exact opposite of anything that anyone before 1965 would ever 
say or promote or think. And they just don't interface with reality very well. And then on the other hand, and their side, I think you have people like Vouch. You know, you have people Vouch. I mean, think Vouch just, he plays an amazing frame game. I went back and I watched the debate with him and me. And, and I had a few points where I thought I trapped him. But he, he disengaged so quickly, I could, never, I could never make any money off of those times where I caught him. He reframed so quickly. He was really good at that. And, you know, and, and he reframed and he counterattacked so quickly that I, I, I actually made some mistakes in fact. You know, I went back and I was like, oh, wow, I, I totally misspoke about that. You know, I totally, you know, I, I had the right idea in my mind, but I misspoke and I had to correct myself. Um, and, and and that's that's a very good way of winning a debate, keeping your opponent always on the back foot. It's just obviously not sincere. And I think that in the long run, that's going to hurt Bausch. I think the, the thing that the right has is that we can look reality in the face and we can still be sincere. And this is one of the reasons why I'm thinking about doing these distance series more with my face is that I think that that is, at the end of the day, how we're going to win. We're going to look at reality. We're going to correctly describe reality. And then we're going to sincerely tell people our takes on reality and explain how that gets us to our position. Is that going to convince the masses? Absolutely not. Most people's opinions are not developed. They're given to them by authority. But... If we go to people who are intelligent, if we go to the intelligentsia for whom the leftist narrative is not working, and after this month, the, the, the moderate leftist narrative, at least, is certainly not working for most people. If we go to them and, in, and, and look at reality in a sincere fashion and, and, and bring to them these ideas, we have the chance of making converts among people who, and I'm not trying to be elitist, we have a chance of making converts that will really matter and, and will really help to sway the narrative in a way that can bring that will not, not again, again, we can't control the mainstream that, but, but we'll be able to bring more resources and better leadership to a project that is trying to radically separate from modernity and from the moderate left consensus that rules our society. We might be able to have a lot of help in constructing radical alternatives that are not leftists once people from the moderate left realize that the direction the left has been taking them is right off of a cliff and if we can get that first little burst of leadership and resources it could be a whole different game it could be a whole, it could be a renaissance i mean i think we're going we're experiencing a mini renaissance of right-wing thought like in this little tiny youtube space but this is nothing this, this, if we do things right, this could be the seed to a new renaissance in, in non-progressive thought that could go in all sorts of directions. There are so many creative avenues for which progressive orthodoxy is literally sitting on our ability to think in new, exciting directions. Maybe I should dedicate a stream to that. I've been going on way too long about contemporary political issues, mainly because the chats usually go in that direction. But maybe I should just do a stream where I just talk about you know exciting new cultural ideas that could be explored but but there's just so many things that are that are like that they, they, they could go in radically new directions if they were just given the right resources and the right people to think about them and, and to develop them and and talking to people sincerely and getting them to move away from leftist modes that could be the first step that could be the first step to building something that's really really new so um, with that, uh, again, forgive the uh, boomer technical issues and, and the quarantine-like uh, slovenly appearance, but hopefully um, I'll be back early this week with another video, and maybe we can do another stream next weekend. Um, I, I definitely intend to have... A, well, okay, so I, I guess I am. Just a, a channel update briefly. I definitely intend to release some like small videos that has been on my mind and then at some point, just stop myself from making videos and go like, okay, you're working on your larger projects from now on. And there's there's two larger projects. There's a trad codex series, and there's there's working on the, on the larger writing project for the distributism treats, uh, treatise. Um, but but in in between, I, I I did want to do live streaming with my wife as well. Um, 
and and I think that we're going to try to move some of our more casual content onto her channel. Um, we just put whatever old garbage on her channel. I mean, I, I don't want to downplay my wife's channel, but we we have been we've been kind of using it as a warehouse for for experiments. Uh, some have called cringy. So I mean, if you want to see me embarrass myself, then subscribe to Catholic Wench because I assure you I will be. Uh, that whatever, but I think we're also might move things like the movie reviews and and, and and conversations about our favorite stuff to that channel as well. But in the meantime, um, I just want to tell everyone here uh, to stay safe, uh, stay sincere, and always keep your eyes on on things that are higher. I think that's sort of a good wish to end with. So um, uh, good night and uh, <laughs> one more boomer error. Uh, I think with that, I can say good night and God bless and have everyone have a safe rest of the week.